Catherine's going to come up and light our chalice. that somebody has a question for me. We didn't get a chance to hear you speak about October's theme of belonging. Will you tell us um, some things about what you share with the congregation about this theme? Wow, what a question. <laughs> summarize a whole month <laughs> of a theme in a quick, you know what, I'll tell you a story. This will do the job. Maybe it was a story I shared with everybody else I don't remember. But do you know that in California, there are these trees called the redwoods? Has anybody heard of the redwoods? Yeah. Yep. Okay, big trees, like really big, right? Yeah. And a lot of them are on the coast of California. And you get, a, I used to live there, so you get this Pacific wind that blows. And sometimes it blows so hard that you would think these big trees, which are really top heavy because all of their branches are way at the top, you'd think they would snap and fall off. But they don't. And you know why? Because their roots intertwine with one another all through the forest. One root goes this way, one root goes that way, one root goes that way. So when it blows, all the trees lean together and then they come back. And they don't snap because they have each other's back. It's a little bit like that, isn't it? Yeah. So. Sometimes we have to belong to a family or a church or a school, and we have to belong because if we don't show up, it's harder for us to face the world. So think about the places you belong. And that's what we try to do here at the church. We try to help you understand what it means to belong. And that's what we were talking about all month long, so that we can be like the roots of those trees that intertwine and they never fall down. And another thing about trees, when there's a forest fire, and there are a lot of forest fires in California. Have you heard about the forest fires? Yeah. Okay, terrible. A lot of forest fires. What happens after a forest fire is the trees that are still alive will drop more pine cones than usual because they know that they've lost some of their sisters and brothers, and they need to see more in order for the forest to come back and young trees to come back. And that's a fact. It's almost like trees know that they belong to each other. So if trees can do it, we can do it, right? We can belong to our families. We can belong to our church. Don't you feel better when you come here? Yeah. Do you have another question? Yes. Why do colors change our moods? Why do colors change our moods? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 
Everybody has a favorite color, right? You all have a favorite color? All right, who's blue? Raise your hand. Who's green? Raise your hand. Who's yellow? Raise your hand. Any yellow? Okay. How about oranges? Okay. Who has black? Anybody got black for a favorite color? Okay, some people love black. You see, here's the thing. Colors change our moods because of what we see in the color. So let's say that you were afraid of the dark at one time, and you never really got over that, so black might not be your favorite color. Maybe a bright color like a yellow, but maybe you've been, you, you know, you found some kind of comfort, your mother held you in a dark room, so maybe black's your favorite color. So sometimes colors can change, but guess what my favorite color is? Anybody want to guess? What is it? Just say it out. Red. Red. And another one? Orange. Orange. I try to match my tie to my stole. It's taken me 50 years to learn how to do that. Yes, Your favorite color is yellow. You see yellow. There is a yellow. There's a gold in here. There's a gold. My favorite color is orange. Okay, next question. What's the best way to embrace the theme of paying attention in our daily lives? What's the best way to embrace the theme of attention in our daily lives? A couple of weeks ago, I asked you, and I didn't get back to you, who has a favorite sound? Anybody have a favorite? What's your favorite sound? To listen to birds. Birds? Another favorite sound? To listen to my cat meowing. Cats meowing. Another favorite sound? Singing and like listening to music. Music? Music. Music? I like the sound of the breeze when it's a really windy day. Oh yeah, that's a nice one. I like the sound of dogs barking really Dogs loud. barking? Like the sound of nature. Nature. One more back here and then I gotta go on. I like the sound of the waves. The waves. Okay, all of those things. I know we have so many more. A favorite sound is something you pay attention to, isn't it? When you hear it, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? So paying attention happens all around us. There's a story about a famous violinist who was playing a violin. He played in front of concert halls and he made a lot of money and he had a $2 million violin. And he went down to the subway in New York City and started playing, and he put out his case, waiting for, like, tips. He played all day long fabulous music in the subway, and all he got was $32. Because people weren't paying attention to the music, where if they'd been in here, they would have paid attention. So paying attention is paying attention to that which gives us the most joy. I think with that, we'll let our kids go. We'll sing them out. while at the same time making space for the sorrows, not just the ones here in this community, but those in the larger UU world and the world community in general. Wednesday, November 20th is Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is also known as International Transgender Day of Remembrance. It is a day to memorialize those who have been murdered because of their trans identity and to draw attention to the continued violence endured by transgender people. I invite you to meditate on the words of UU Minister Sunshine Wolf, followed by a minute of quiet meditation. <laughs> On this Transgender Day of Remembrance, we remember those who have been murdered for being who they are. Those who face violence on a daily basis. Those who have lost loved ones. And those who worry about loved ones. May we come to a time when we cease to shame children around gender roles and expression. 
where we allow for freedom and exploration of identity and expression and to a world that operates from love especially when things are difficult and confusing may we all who live with the threat of violence find support strength community hope and safety from violence been embracing my, the side of me that's a humanist. Um, I, the problem I feel I have always had with humanism is the overemphasis on what uh, the, the big thing that humanists generally don't believe in, don't believe in God. So the emphasis has always been on the what not they don't believe in. But I, I think that's the wrong way to go about it because humanism, the human being, I think it's a celebration of the good in human beings. It's how when we are at our best, what we can accomplish. When we're at our best, how we can really be there for one another and where we can um, be present and, and always, and it's a trust that we are always trying our best now our best may not look like the best to someone else, but it's a trust that, is, that me and my fellow human beings, we are all trying our best. We are all trying to make this world a better place. So, um, so when I embrace that piece of humanism, I, I get it, it makes complete sense to me. So, does that work? That's done. That worked, yeah. Ed. What is your secret to successful transition between so many ministers? <laughs> oh, between what? <laughs> so many ministers. So many ministers. Did you mean like historically? Or Either historically or during a service to transition from one to the other. One must need to know when to open the mouth and close the mouth. <laughs> Um, for, thank you, for Jim Francic, how long were you a Catholic priest? Oh, well, I was a Catholic priest four years. I was ordained 51 years ago, so that's quite a while ago. But I have been a minister still all those years, doing lots of things. Thank you. Shelley, what's the difference between a therapist and a minister? Oh my goodness. Um, ministry, we get to do a lot of the fun, joyful, happy things in life. 
And people often come into therapy with uh, their traumas, their tragedies, the difficult things in life. And so I find that ministry is a little bit more holistic. It's the whole picture of everything going on with human beings, from babies being born to people dying to uh, wondering about all the big questions in life and then just really being <coughs> present with one another, no matter what's going on, no matter what we're doing, we're always with each other, no matter what. And in therapy, of course, the role of the therapist is very different than a minister, if any of you have ever been. The therapist is there to listen and to offer some framing of how everybody's individual story actually does fit into this big picture of the human experience. And that person's there specifically to help you find your own answers. So they're similar, there's some overlap, but uh, I think that uh, for me in particular, the ministry, the variety of all the different things that I get to do is what makes it really special to me. <coughs> Thank you. For Reverend John, in your view, what are the pros and cons of the meditative 9 a.m. service? <laughs> Well, it's great. And some of you folks should come to 9 o'clock. Um, you know, uh, we almost tried to kill the 9 well, we almost killed the 9 o'clock service uh, when we thought it was getting to the point where there were more people in the choir than in the congregation. Uh, and, and, and Ed and I sat down and we kind of figured, well, what, 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 what can we do here? And uh, the decision was made that, well, let's try to turn it into a more meditative space. And then we can sort of sunset the meditation, we can sunset the service itself and just make it a meditation. Well, wouldn't you know when we added more, more, more contemplative music, longer meditation, I mean much longer meditation, uh, and just sort of a quieter message that people started coming. And all of a sudden, you know, 40, 50, 60 people at the 9 o'clock service where we thought it was dead and it came back to life. So. Um, the sermon is basically the same, although it changes a little bit from time to time. The, the emphasis are a little different. I sometimes call that the contemplative service as, uh, as compared to this, which is I call the celebratory service. Uh, so different, different energy completely. I mean, it's, it's really quite... And we have some very stalwart 9 a.m.ers who really like coming there. Uh, it's the time where they can get that, 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 that space in their life. It's really become a, really something quite special. I encourage you to try it if you haven't tried it. I know it's a little earlier in the morning, but that's part of the magic is that you're done by 10. <laughs> <laughs> and you're out. Thank you, John. For Margalee, how and when did you know that ministry was the right path for you? I thought it was when I... Um, would have conversations with the DRE at my first UU congregation about uh, four or five years ago. We would have this conversation because she was attending seminary and then she posed a question to me. It's like, um, have you considered that? And I was like, huh. But um, last year while I was in Florida, I grew up in Florida, I was attending a, um, um, a retreat. And I realized that I, I've always had the call to ministry. I say maybe my phone was on silence, <laughs> so I wasn't hearing the call. But then I, I grew up, I think I've said this here before, I grew up Jehovah's Witness, and as a woman that's not, as a female identified person, it's not something you even consider. So, um, you know, I would do, I would, behave ministerially, ministerially, whatever that means, but it never occurred, the thought just never occurred to me that I could be a minister. So then I, you know, my mind just got rid of that. And it wasn't until I was in Florida, like I said, um, last year, and I realized, whoa, yeah, um, I'm glad I uh, turned the phone back on, turned the ringer back on on my phone and I could fully hear um, the call. So I would say maybe since I was, well, but didn't realize it until four years ago. I won't say how old I was then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now for Ed, this is a two-part. I'm going to read the question and I'll read you the quote that goes with it. 
Is reality what each of us thinks it is? <laughs> Quote, I know that nothing is real without my beholding it. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Well, what you're entering into with when you when you use a word like reality, you're necessarily <clears throat> dealing with something called perception. And as soon as you enter perceptual realms, you're dealing with the individual. Is there something such as reality outside of individual perceptions? There are many people who would say, very definitely, yes, there are. And so the question then becomes, if, if, if you believe there is a greater reality, how do you access that? Most of the Eastern traditions would say, you do it through meditation and specific spiritual practices which allow you to have a communication with that world. And by communication, I'm not talking about the English language. I'm talking about uh, very inner experiences, not just thoughts or concepts, but actual experiences, which transmit kinds of information which then you can uh, experience and, and make some sense out of to whatever degree your frontal lobes make sense. But that's where music comes in, you see, because information isn't just trans transmitted through language. Information is transmitted in many different ways. Think about the sounds that you take in and ingest. Those sounds have both emotive qualities as well as physical qualities. When we Taken, I mean, if you go to a rock concert, you get one kind of experience. And they're not putting a judgment, judgment on rock concerts. If you go to another kind of concert, you'll get a different kind of experience. So there's all kinds of information that we take in. And when we take it in completely with an open heart center, we tend to get a very close, profound communication with an essence that we don't, uh, normally don't get with, with conscious consciousness. So, I know my time is up. I could go on forever. <laughs> so I'm sorry to be, talk to me afterwards if you want to move on. I wasn't sure how close I was going to have to get to Ed. Um, we did ask them to try to answer these questions, which is very difficult, in a minute and a half, so we can get through as many questions as possible. I can tell we're not going to get through them all. Uh, for Shelley. How can I love everyone when some people are so negative? <laughs> That's something that affects every one of us. We're all going to encounter people, whether it be the person who cut us off in traffic or a family member over the Thanksgiving table. We just don't know when we're going to come up against somebody's bad day or bad attitude. And what I try to do is I kind of think of it as having a couple of different channels that I can access with my awareness. So maybe the first impact of that person's behavior is I feel angry or irritated at them and want to call them names. And then I think about, you know, it's just not about me, it's not my problem. I'm going to put them in a little pink bubble and bye-bye. <laughs> Have a good day. And it just it helps to be able to find some reason to laugh about it. And then I also remember that I just don't know the whole story. I don't know what's happening. I maybe want to think to myself, well, what's wrong with you? And activist Ruby Sales says to us, the question we really need to ask is, what happened? What happened? So trying to find compassion or at least a little bit of a a place where I can say, well, I know I've not always been a ray of sunshine myself. So anytime we can take that, perhaps that move back to get a bigger perspective, that this is a human being having an experience of some kind, 
and I don't want to make it worse by adding my negativity to theirs, so I'm going to send them a little prayer of hope or a little uh, positive energy, and maybe that will help a little bit. And it certainly makes me feel better when I do that. Thank you. Uh, for Jim, what makes a community building group a church? Mm. Beautiful question. Uh, community is where we come to know who we are. Without community, we probably really don't ever get to know that. So that if I choose to be alone, I choose then to walk around with uh, half knowledge of who I am. Community is also where we get to experience the, the give and take, the sharing of uh, different perspectives of truth, uh, different ways to take on life. Uh, I, I think I've shared, some, some, in my work as a chaplain, uh, sometimes we have patients that have no family, no community, and they're at their deathbed. There's no one there for them. And I always ask myself, what was it about this person's either choices or the injuries of life that leave him, him, him or her completely alone right now? We have such a wonderful experience in this community here. We have an openness to whatever we want to discuss. We've got 46 committees that we could be part of and be doing just about anywhere and anything. I, mean, I often describe experience here as that whatever you do, don't stop in the lobby or you'll get run over by all the activity. Because there is so much energy and good work that is being done here. And, uh, and that's because there is a loving community here that is accepting. When, uh, when we were thinking of coming here, uh, you know, some years ago, uh, I didn't have any idea what a Unitarian was, by the way, at all. I just, I knew there was a church over here had driven past it. And a friend of mine, when we had come back from Colorado, said, you know, you're a Unitarian. I said, what is that? <laughs> and he said, come go over and talk to Frank, you'll find out. And of course, what I found out is that we have a community here that ex everybody is acceptable. Everybody is welcome. Whatever your story is, your, your, your life story, your religious story, your spiritual story, come and share it. We're not here to tell you it's wrong. We're here to learn from whatever you, you have to share, and we'll grow together. And that was the experience I had here. Okay, and that's you, why uh, I find, I know I'm getting the hook here, I think. <laughs> I could go on on this one. <laughs> I know you all could give more than a minute and a half, but I'm going to ask John now to define spirituality. <laughs> so, fortunately, I've had this question before. Um, and there are a lot of definitions, I think, of course. Uh, I think that some of us get a little hung up uh, on, the, on the idea that spirituality implies some sort of belief in a in an uh, extracorporeal spirit, but I don't think that's what it means. For me, spirituality is that part of our life, that part of our experience that gives us meaning, that gives us the most meaning. Actually, I'd say the, what gives us the most meaning is our faith. And I would say spirituality is, is, is accessed any time you are garnering a meaning that is deeper than just yourself that you're part of something bigger. Music has that ability to do it to many of us. Walking in nature, and here we sit in this transcendentalist chapel, mm -hmm. uh, all around us watching nature change, that can be a very spiritual experience. For some people it's chanting, for some people it's prayer, for some people it's meditation, some people it's walking in the woods. You will find that spiritual path, and all of you are spiritual. So the thing, the thinking that this is something reserved for woohoo, you know, people who are not like us, grounded, rational, Unitarian Universalists, that's just not the case. You're all spiritual people, and you just we all access it a little differently. But we come together here, I would say, and we access this community. To get back to Jim's point, we access this community, and the community building itself is spiritual. Thank you, John. Mark Lee. We love your meditation segments. What is an easy way to practice on your own? 
So a friend of mine, um, we just started, just literally, we had an 8.30 a.m. appointment. Um, I call her or she calls me and we set in a, um, our alarm for five, 10 minutes. We've been, we're at 10 minutes now. And we just, um, we'll start out with a brief check and how are you? And then we start the timer and we're just um, quietly sitting in each other's company even though she's all the way in Buffalo, New York. And I'm here and, um, and just taking a moment and for me, what I do on my side is I reflect on the day before. What are some of the moments where um, I was my best self? And then where are, where are the areas where I missed the mark? And it's not a judgment thing, so it's like, huh, well, do better next time. And then I look at what's coming for me of today and, um, and what will I do with it type thing, you know, and my friend Christina on, on her side has said uh, recently, the last time we were meditating, she said she felt like moving, so all of a sudden she was sitting and she just stood up and started moving slowly. Uh, so it, um, it's just taking, I say the simplest way is just take, sometimes just one minute, take a breather from whatever you're doing and just kind of stop and take a moment and um, go inward. Uh, some people is focusing on your, on your breathing. And if your mind wanders, that's fine. Um, gently bring it back or let it wander. So I, you know, I just make it very low maintenance and, and not stress too much on it. Right. Thank you. This is for anyone who'd like to answer. I'm an atheist. Do I still belong here? <laughs> Certainly not alone. Um, I thought Margulies' answer to the question about humanism uh, hit the mark for me as well. Uh, instead of focusing on what we don't believe, which atheism, by the way, is a faith statement. <laughs> you're absolutely certain no God exists. That's that's a faith statement. You're making a, a, a you're asserting something about ultimate reality. So that becomes a faith statement, and that's fine uh, because there are many of us here who uh, are convinced that the world in which we live is the world that is, has meaning for us, that the relationships that we have for one another are the relationships that matter, and that we don't need to place our faith in some other extraterrestrial being out there uh, that, will, that will make the world uh, a better place in the end. Uh, I've often sat at the bedside of folks who are uh, dying, and they are atheists, uh, maybe sometimes more agnostic, which is to be uncertain about whether there's another reality beyond this one. And uh, I will always ask them, do you think there's anything else beyond this life? And they'll say no. And I find that to be a tremendous statement of courage, to be absolutely certain that this is the only life there is. Uh, and I honor that. I honor that courage on that, on that path. Wonderful. Could I take a short sure. breath? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the atheist... Uh, I don't believe in God, and of course, if we look at historically uh, all of our lives, and we think of all the ways that God has been presented to us, there are many of us that would stand up, I don't believe in that God, or this God, or that God would ask of this. You know, and that's, and that's certainly a path that a, an atheist might develop on, I would, God would never do. In other words, the assumption that the agency of God is acting on us in very deliberate ways. Pat and I lost our son to an accidental death many years ago. Often when people, when that happens, people go to, God did that to us, God didn't do that to us. There was a number of things came together and we lost our son. Okay. So we have lots of reasons to believe that the way that God has been characterized doesn't exist, and so that could lead to atheism or calling yourself an atheist. Uh, I find uh, the, the reference to agnosticism, I really don't know absolutely to be far more acceptable these days. Many years ago, I didn't even know what that meant. So. <laughs> I'm going to 
going to take time for one more question. To the ministers, what do you wish we as the congregants would do more of or do less of? <laughs> All right, we're just going to go down the line here quickly. <laughs> In the Lakota tradition, the prayer of the pipe is that we would be a hollow tube through which the unconditional love of source energy or the creator might flow. My hope is that we would be that in our community, the source of unconditional acceptance of each other. I would love to have uh, more of you accept the invitation to come and share a passion or gift, something that you absolutely love with our children and our youth community. They would love to have you join us. I'm very pragmatic. I'd like you to come to church more often <laughs> and try the 9 o'clock service. Uh, it's really great. Listen, when you come, your life is better. Our life is better. It's just that simple. And sometimes you're actually, by your very presence, saving the life of somebody who just needs to know that they're not alone in the world. Two short answers. I've got a place for everybody in one of my choirs. <laughs> Two, and this is going to sound humorous, but I'm actually quite serious. Keep breathing. <laughs> I think um, to take a risk and let's have the difficult conversations. Um, and for that to happen, we have to be willing to make the space to hear the difficult things, right? Um, you know, I think, you know, there's so much going on in the world, so many difficult issues, so many injustices, so many people are suffering. And I think sometimes because we don't have the answers, we don't, then we don't have the difficult conversations, we don't talk about the very difficult things, so I'd love for us to have those discussions, to talk about those things, and because I think that's how we get to know one another better, get to know, become building community, because I think that's come around a couple of times here, we build communities, and, um, and um, move forward and do the work as Unitarian Universalists. So, I have an invitation to the difficult conversations. Thank you. So that ends our question box part of the service.